From people who stood against the impossible. To battles that will forever hang in the hallways of history. Join us as we count down our list of reasons as to why none of us will ever understand what it's like to be that awesome or brave. Yeah, if I'm being honest, like I, I want to be that awesome, but I also don't want to die that way. Like, at all. And on that grim note, welcome back to The Hive, everyone. I'm Rachel Fish. And I'm Taylor McWaters, and today we are counting down our list of top 10 epic battles of history that made heroes. Let's get going. Let's do it. Number 10, the Swiss Last Stand. Guys, this list taught me a lot of things, but one thing stands out above the rest. We are so freaking soft, like so damn soft. I have never, nor will I probably, who knows, ever face certain death willingly, like these people did. Lutheran mercenaries on May 6th, 1527 were pillaging across northern Italy and finally they made it to Rome. They made straight for Vatican Hill and Pope Clement VII was on the hit list. While he was being smuggled out of Rome, 189 Swiss guards stood up against 20,000 bloodthirsty and angry troops. They formed a fighting square and based on numbers alone, what should have been a quick victory turned into an all day battle. The Swiss troops managed to beat back wave after wave of troops. When their swords dulled, they fought with daggers. When the daggers got lost, they fought with fists and teeth. It just went on and on. Sadly, they were taken down to the very last man, but their perseverance and courage still stand against the test of time. Number nine, the Battle of Hastings. Winding the clocks back to 1066 to the Battle of Hastings, this one went down in East Sussex, England, and it happened in the middle of October, so why not include this one in the list? This battle was fought between the Norman French army of William, Duke of Normandy, and the English army under the command of King Harold Godwinson. This kicked off the Norman conquest of England. According to William the Conqueror, the previous king of England, Edward the Confessor, originally promised the crown to William. He promised him the crown, but right before he passed away, the guy was on his deathbed and he literally changed his mind. How rude. Instead, he passed the crown onto Harold Godwinson. So William, yeah, he was, he was a tad upset at this point. So he and his forces defeated Godwinson, went right into London and became England's first Norman king. Epic. Number eight, Vimy Ridge. I learned about this in school and my history teacher was so excited to tell me about it and I'm still excited about it today. This battle is the reason Canadian soldiers earned their notoriety during World War One. The Battle of Vimy Ridge remains a testament to expert organization and strategy. From April 9th to 12th in 1917, four divisions of the Canadian Corps captured Vimy Ridge from the Germans, making the largest territorial advance made by any allied force in the war. The losses were significant, resulting in 10,000 thousand men either killed or wounded, so it wasn't the easiest win. However, through their meticulous planning and secret operations, they were able to break the stalemate between the allied and enemy forces. Soldiers before they were sent over actually trained on a replica of Vimy Ridge, so they were like well rehearsed when they showed up. They knew Vimy Ridge like the back of their hand. Meanwhile, at Vimy Ridge, 11 tunnels were constructed in secret to bring the first wave out safely in front of German lines. Each tunnel was also equipped with lighting, water supplies, and first aid. Behind front lines, the soldiers moved in well rehearsed timed attacks based on where allied and enemy trenches were marked. Vimy Ridge marked a change in military tactic and highlighted the heroic nature of Canadian soldiers. Yeah, Vimy Ridge is kind of like a big deal over here. It's kind of cool. It wasn't just Canadians, they were like British soldiers too. But, you know, take it where you can get it. Number seven, the Siege of Orleans. 1429, this battle marked the first major military victory for the French Royal Army following their defeat 30 years prior at the Battle of Agincourt. The Siege of Orleans is noted mostly for the involvement of Joan of Arc. This was during the late stages of the Hundred Year War between England and France. For about six months, the English was winning, but nine days after Joan of Arc's arrival, the siege collapsed. Joan of Arc was just 17 years old also during this battle. But even before this, when she was just 12 or 13, she started to hear voices is apparently from God. She saw these visions as well and during her trial she testified that saints and angels told her to go to church, to live a good life, and to also establish Charles VII to the French throne and be the country's rightful king. Not a bad tip off from the God Squad. Now while she did command the army at a young age, Joan of Arc didn't actually participate in combat. She did outline strategies and inspire troops and also she was famous for her temper. That's pretty epic. Number six, the Winter War. The Winter War during World War II is not spoken of often, despite it being kind of incredible. Stalin was looking to expand his territory and had long wanted a reason to take over Finland. And 
And so they invaded. Vastly outnumbered and outgunned, Finland should have fallen, but they didn't. One reason is that they were fighting on their turf, and two, a man named Simo Heha. Marshal Carl Gustav Mannerheim created a complex network of concrete bunkers, trenches, and fortifications that discouraged tank attacks by the Russians. The Finnish also used their skis to take out men through like lightning fast hit and run attacks. But Simo Heha made the Soviets shake in their boots. He was credited for over 500 kills within 100 days, despite being a humble farmer. He became known as the White Death and was one of the reasons that in just three months, Russia suffered 300,000 casualties while Finland sat at 65,000. Wow. Number five, the Battle of Marathon. Every New Year's Eve, there's always a guy on Facebook who just becomes a runner all of a sudden. They have the squirt water belt, the whole thing. They train for a marathon. But what is a marathon? Was it a person? Is it just a name for 42 kilometers? Well, it was a battle back in 490 BC between ancient Greeks and Persian invaders sent by King Darius. The Persians arrived to Marathon, about 20,000 of them. They arrived to punish the Greeks for supporting the Lanians who revolted against the Persians. The Greeks were outnumbered greatly, but but they attacked hard and fast and they took out 6,000 Persians and eventually they just fled entirely. The number of Greek fighters lost was only around 200, so far less casualties. The story of Phidippides came to be at this time. He ran the first ever marathon. He ran all the way from Marathon to Athens to deliver messages. BBM wasn't a thing back then, so he just had to blow his kneecaps out six times a day. He was one of the Greek military men known as the day-long runners. He did six marathons back to back, basically. Meanwhile, my uncle on Facebook books like hashtag runner life. <laughs> okay. No, next, delete, delete. Number four, the Battle of Waterloo. Fun fact, in grade 10, my classmate and I reenacted the Napoleonic Wars with breakfast sandwiches that we made and brought to class. We got an A. Anyways, the Napoleonic Wars lasted between 1803 to 1815 and led to the deaths of over five million people. But after only nine hours of bloodshed next to the Belgian town of Waterloo, the world changed forever. This moment in history marked the end of Napoleon's attempt at conquering Europe. On June 18th, 1815, Allied forces Forces composed of British, Dutch, Belgian, and German thwarted Napoleon's attack. Thanks to them, Napoleon was left singing, Waterloo, I was defeated and you won the war. Ava. It paved the way for the powers today, lending a pathway for the British to become a global power, good and bad. Demand for American war supplies was crucial during the Napoleonic Wars as they remained neutral. Britain somewhat got in the way of the trading, but the Europeans' need for American cotton and grain became a higher importance, therefore establishing America as like a power. Now there was a lot of bloodshed behind the scenes here as we know from colonialism in general, though it is clear that this battle changed the course of history for more good and bad to arise. We have to include one of the most important battles of World War II on this list. We've seen this one on screen now numerous times. Every time I watch Saving Private Ryan, I don't breathe for that entire beach sequence. It's I couldn't even imagine what that must have been like in real life. Beginning on June 6, 1944, 156,000 American, Canadian, and British troops arrived at five beaches along the coast of France's Normandy region. Before the invasion, the Allied forces made this large-scale campaign, a deceptive one in order to mislead the Germans. Come August, most of northern France was liberated, and not long after the Germans were defeated. Historians referred to this battle as the beginning of the end of the war in Europe. The late Ray Lambert, who recently passed in April at age 100, was an army medic during D-Day. His unit was sent to Normandy that June, and Ray Lambert saved 15 lives that day, despite having a broken back himself. He would drag injured men from the water to the secure small area behind this concrete block. He was 23 during D-Day as well. I'll save you the math. At the 75th anniversary ceremony of D-Day, that same block was named Ray's Rock and has a plaque on it honoring Lambert and his men. Number two, 300. Yeah, it was real. If you've seen the movie and the abundance of rippling pectorals, then you have heard of 300. But no, it wasn't just a movie, it happened, but the 300 was actually more like 4,000. But still, when you put it side by side to the massive hordes of enemies they faced, it might as well be 300. The Battle of 300 refers to the actual Battle of Thermopylae. King Leonidas was raised as roughly and brutally as depicted in the film, perhaps even harsher. So when horsemen from the east appeared in 481 BC as messengers from the god king Xerxes of Persia, he knew what he was to face. They demanded land and water, aka obedience to the empire. But instead of just Spartans, Athens and Sparta decided to form an alliance. It was suggested that they block the narrow passage, the hot gates, of the Thermopylae coast. The Spartans and Greeks faced over 150,000 Persian soldiers, and despite fierce fighting, they did lose. However, the battle remains one of the most famous in Greek history, not because they lost, but because of the testament of courage that 
stood against thousands. And coming in at number one, the Battle of Yorktown. Well, the surrender at Yorktown, rather. On this day, October 19th, 1781, the Americans defeated the British at Yorktown, Virginia. British General Lord Cornwallis had to surrender about 8,000 soldiers, bringing an end to the American Revolution. Alexander Hamilton, the first Secretary of the Treasury of the United States, famously killed in a duel with Aaron Burr. If you have Disney+, Plus, go watch the musical Hamilton, because you'll be dancing your way through history lessons in no time. According to historian and author of Alexander Hamilton, the formative years, Hamilton had a genius and was working hard, but did not come from an illustrious family like most of the founding fathers. He knew that winning glory in battle would make him famous and therefore help him further his career. Seriously, if you haven't seen Hamilton, I implore you to dive in tonight. It is the anniversary. What else do you have going on? Let's do it. And that was our list from today. If you liked it, let us know. And if you have any ideas as to what we should throw into part two, let us know in the comments down below. We'll do the rest. And if you want a part two, like just like, you know, share this thing, make it go out. And also don't forget to subscribe to stay part of the hive. I've been your host, Rachel Fisher. And I've been Taylor McWaters, and this is us buzzing off.